Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm in Ottawa right now. I'm standing on the uh, Portage Bridge and uh, this is the Ottawa River running uh, beneath me here. Although the flow rate seems uh, quite ferocious um, on this um, May 5th evening, it's running at about uh, 8,300 cubic meters per second where it's being measured um, at uh, Carillon. And uh, during the peak, about uh, April 29th or so, the flow rate was um, 9,600 cubic meters per second. And uh, so that was the peak uh, flooding period. Two years ago, this time two years ago, we had another 100 year flood in Ottawa and the peak flow rate for that flood was about 9,100 cubic meters per second. So in 2019 here we surpassed the previous uh, flow rate record um, and also heights of, in, of the water levels in, along the shorelines of the Ottawa River which impacted huge numbers of homeowners in, in the town of Gatineau on the Quebec side and also uh, in Ottawa itself and uh, many places upstream were also flooded. So the flow rate, the peak flow rate then in 2017 was 9,100, 9,600 this year, which um, is about a 5% uh, increase. And uh, that 9,600, like I said, has dropped about uh, 1,200 or so to about 8,400 cubic meters per second. So it's dropped about uh, just over 10% uh, from the uh, peak. So one of the things about this year's flood is it's quite different from the one in uh, 2017. Oh, this is the, uh, what you can see in the background is you can see the Chaudier uh, Bridge up here, the Chaudier Bridge. And uh, there was some structural damage on the uh, bottom of the bridge, very minimal. So the bridge was shut down about a week ago because the water was, uh, the waves and uh, wave action was hitting the bottom, some of the bottom pipes running across the uh, bridge carrying, I'm not sure what, but they were uh, sheared off and damaged. So engineers want the water level to go down uh, a bit so they can do a careful assessment of the uh, structure of the bridge. Luckily, we're, it's all, we're all bedrock here. So it's bedrock on the supports on either side of that bridge and of this bridge, the Portage Bridge. Um, and uh, these uh, standing wave patterns that you can see um, in the water behind me, um, some of them, uh, you know, they're several meters high at least. Um, I think they're, uh, they're, they're in the, I don't know how deep the water is here, but these standing wave patterns are uh, actually quite um, bottom uh, topography dependent. So big rocks on the bottom and they'd have to be pretty damn big to, to not move. Um, or, uh, I don't, like I said, I don't know how deep it is, but there's just so much water running through here. Uh, my wife was telling me last week that the flow rate of water, I don't know if it was the flow rate or the, the I think it, the flow velocity was double that of uh, Niagara Falls or something like that. So there's a tremendous amount of water coming from the northern watershed. And this is a massive watershed. There's a lot of reservoirs at the far northern end of it. But then when you get about halfway down, it's all run of the river dams and things. So there's no ability to control the water flow once you're about halfway down the watershed there is up above. Now the problem this year is, so there's a couple different things. Um, the, pro the main problem this year is that we had a very, very cold, a cold blob over North America. So the jet streams were super wavy and the trough of the jet streams was coming down and it was persistently over North America. That's a low pressure area, lots of snow, so the snowpack is about double uh, what it would be in a normal year. 
And uh, this, this snowpack in the north, what they do is they empty the reservoirs, they lower down the water level in the main reservoirs throughout the winter. And then uh, they're, so they're fairly low level of water come the spring uh, fresh at the spring melt. And then they can store that water. They can and uh, until the dam, until the reservoir capacity is full, and then let it out slowly um, to try to taper it out. Often in Ottawa here, we get a double peak um, of flow rates. We get a, a peak from the lower half of the uh, watershed where there's no ability to hold back and control the water. So that peak is the one that we've just experienced about a week ago. And often there's a second uh, peak in the water flow when the reservoirs in the north get full and have to dump water to stay safe within safe limit. And that second peak um, is often larger than the first peak. So this is, uh, you know, this is an issue uh, you know, the interaction of human control when you respond to flooding events is very, very crucial. If you watch my videos from two years ago on the Ottawa River flooding, on the last day of the major flooding, the water in Ottawa came up about 10 inches in the space of uh, half of a day and it overtopped uh, what sandbags there were and caused you know, a huge extra amount of damage in last year's flooding. And uh, this can be, I believe, associated with the rede release of water from uh, a, a reservoir, reservoir in the far north called the Swisha, or De, De Joshin, J-O-A-C-H-I-N, I believe. Um, you know, I went up there on a road trip with a friend of mine whose house was flooded out, and we talked to residents and stuff, and it was written up in the papers how the rocks were showing at the bottom of this reservoir and the water had been released uh, several days before the huge, uh, before that water plug then came down through the whole system and, uh, you know, raised the level of flooding in Ottawa by about 10 inches on the last day in 2017 when it peaked. So this year is quite a, you know, and back then, if I see, I recall that we had about, I think it was about, 220 millimeters of rain for the month of uh, April and March was also loads of rain. So the uh, ground gets saturated. The ground is frozen first of all in the winter, especially if but during the freeze up in the uh, late fall, if there's a lot of water saturated in the ground and the ground freezes, then it freezes rock hard and there's no way water initially can uh, infiltrate into the soil so it just runs off it has to run off and then run down into the uh, into the rivers and uh, <clears throat> the watershed so so that's a very important factor but I as, I've, as many of you know now okay the jet streams are slower and wavier and getting stuck in place because the Arctic is warming so quickly Arctic temperature amplification because of the albedo effect, the Arctic is a lot darker place. It's absorbing more solar radiation. It's heating by itself. It's, it's warming at two to three times the uh, global average. And if you go up into the high Arctic, it's more like four to five times. Okay, so the, the greatly warming Arctic has decreased the temperature difference to the equator. And that, that reduction of temperature gradient makes the jet streams slow down and become wavier and become stuck so we had this trough over North America, this stuck weather pattern resulting in huge numbers of uh, snowfall events. All of this snow dumped, several, you know, double, double the amount of snowpack, which is now being uh, thawing. And uh, also this year, you know, we haven't had quite as much rainfall as we had in 2017 during those floods. Right, but but the extra water is being made up by the uh, the extra snowpack and the melting in the uh, snowpack. So hopefully we're through the worst of it. You know there are many many thousands of volunteers along the beaches putting down sandbags and things. I heard that the city of Ottawa 
it's estimated that there's like 1.3 million sandbags have been laid. The Canadian Army was called in, it was declared a, a flood emergency for Ottawa uh, over a week ago, and it, that was a few days, that was the day after. Ottawa Count, City Councilor declared a climate change emergency. Um, so the Army came in uh, a week ago Friday, about nine days ago, and uh, helped out a lot of people by sandbagging. There were all kinds of volunteers. So 1.2 million, 1.2, 1.3 million sandbags. So now the city is thinking, well, you know, how long do we have to leave these sandbags in place? You know, and how are we going to remove them? So they've asked the volunteers to rest up because I'm sure they'll ask for lots of people's help um, in actually removing sandbags. Now, one of the questions I have is, uh, you know, maybe we should just leave the sandbags in place. You know, if we're going to get these flooding events, these extreme weather events along the river every few years, you know, the statistics of the weather has changed. So, you know, one in a, what used to be a one in a hundred year event is clearly no longer a one in a hundred year event. It might be a one in ten year, or one in five year event. So maybe they should just leave the sandbags there. Um, you know, if you have a house along the Ottawa River that was flooded out a couple years ago, you have a lot of very tough decisions to make because if, it, if this flooding continues, you know, frequently every few years, your house property value along the river, your, your house value along the river will go to zero because it won't be insurable anymore. And, uh, you know, if you were trying to sell it and the buyer couldn't pay in cash and not, you know, uh, not worry about not have, have insurance or worry about that. I mean, if they're trying to get a mortgage to pay for a place, the place has to be insured. The banks require the place to be insured. So there's a real issue. Um, you know, there won't be a lot of buyers for these properties unless they actually do what do what, you know, I told many people, including some friends that, you know, after two years ago, you know, take the insurance money and just jack up the structure that you have a floor, jack it up uh, six or eight or 10 feet. Um, use and you know you can use the space underneath the storage space and you can enjoy the river you won't be scared every time it rains every time it snows and a lot in the winter you know you won't be having flashbacks and thinking ah, you know I'm gonna be screwed again right your place will be jacked up it'll be a floor higher and uh, you know well out of uh, harm's way when the uh, when the river floods um, right I mean if you're gonna have there, I don't see any other solution um, there I mean it's, it's affecting a lot of people um, you know and I, I, I have uh, I know people that, that live along the river I'm I'm well away from the river personally but you know I've been this um, flooding and uh, you know I know I've been reporting and stuff a lot of stuff in my videos about abrupt climate change and rapid climate change and and uh, you know, climate extreme events, weather extreme events in the last number of years. And uh, you kind of compartmentalize and uh, you know, just try to focus on the facts. And you know, it's, it's, uh, if you start getting into the human and the emotional sides of these floods, it can be very difficult to deal with. And I've, I've found that uh, you know, when these things are hitting really close to home, like the flood, in Ottawa two years ago the, the tornadoes in Ottawa um, just in September of last year you know that wasn't very long ago that's about uh, you know eight months ago or so eight or nine months ago you know and now and uh, you know now this flooding again you know climate change is affecting all of us but you know until you really see it happening in your neighborhood until it's your home that's uh, damaged, you know, it, it can be hard. The human brain has an incredible capacity to try to ignore the harsh realities, the, especially when things are changing very fast. We're sort of set in our ways, you know, our world views, we're, we're, we're kind of comfortable um, and we have a lot of psychological mechanisms to protect us, to keep us uh, on an even keel. And, uh, you know, when these uh, type of extreme weather events are happening, 
you know, I can walk down to the river and see flooded houses and stuff. It starts to get you personally, so, you know, it gets you down a bit. Anyway, thanks for listening.